Bun că la emisiunea Știință și Cunoaștere. În data de 18 iunie 2013 am avut ocazia specială de a înregistra un nou interviu cu profesorul american de biologie, dr. Bruce Lipton. Inițial, acest interviu a fost prevăzut să aibă durata de 60 de minute și managerul lui Bruce Lipton mi-a spus că, din păcate, nu va avea mai mult timp la dispoziție, nici măcar pentru câteva probe tehnice. Chiar m-a avertizat asupra faptului că după discuția de o oră pe care urma să o avem, domnul Lipton avea programat o conferință televizată și era așteptat să intre în emisie în direct. Am verificat câteva secunde caseta la început, am fost încântat să recepționez o imagine mult mai bună în standard HD, din fericire sunetul în limba engleză a fost foarte bun, iar surpriza a apărut când la un moment dat a trebuit să schimb caseta și eu de-abia am parcurs doar jumătate din întrebările care le aveam pregătite. Și discuția noastră a devenit atât de captivantă încât practic nu o puteam întrerupe. Însă noi depășeam orarul prestabilit cu aproape 9 luni în avans, minut cu minut. Vă dați seama cât de ocupat este domnul Bruce Lipton. Diverse semnale sonore ne indicau faptul că țineam linia de comunicare ocupată. Un alt post de televiziune american avea nevoie urgentă să preia legătura, dar noi nu reușeam să finalizăm discuțiile. Cel mai mare coșmar al unui producător de televiziune este să întârzie invitatul la emisiune în direct. Desigur, de data aceasta, avantajul era de partea mea, deoarece eu aveam la dispoziție 10 ore și cel puțin 10 casete video pregătite. V-am povestit aceste detalii, pe de o parte amuzante, dar pe de altă parte ele reflectă seriozitatea și importanța deosebită pe care profesul american vă acordă dumneavoastră și indirect mie ca mesager al mesajului său către dumneavoastră deoarece apreciați continuu cărțile și ideile sale. Și din acest motiv, Bruce Lipton a stat de vorbă cu mine încă 50 de minute suplimentare în care am tratat subiecte, precum regula minorității și superorganismul numit omenire, mintea conștientă versus mintea subconștientă, evoluție spontană, teoria fractarilor în natură și biologie, remisie spontană, proiectul conștiinței globale, relația dintre meme și gene, celule imaginale și spre final vom discuta despre darwinism, Deoarece se pare că unul dintre cei mai importanți promotori ai darwinismului, profesorul Richard Dawkins, a făcut o declarație care sugerează că noi nu ar trebui să construim o societate bazată pe teoria evoluționistă a lui Charles Darwin. A fost un lucru extraordinar că a acceptat să-mi ofere aceste 50 de minute suplimentare. Așa după cum ați sesizat, domnia sa vorbește foarte repede, așa că pentru mine a fost un adevărat tur de forță să îl pot urmări și să conduc discuția fără a mai menționa lucruri la subtitrare. Cel mai bun sfat este să revizionați emisiunea luni dimineața la ora 11 și ulterior de pe internet, unde fișierul permite vizionări ce pot fi controlate de un buton de pauză. Așadar, vizionare plăcută cu partea a doua a interviului cu Dr. Bruce Lipton via internet din California, Statele Unite. Hello and welcome Dr. Bruce Lipton on our science and knowledge program here on TVR Cluj, Romania for the third time. Christian, I, I want to thank you very much for, for uh, you know, calling on me and I hope that I can uh, offer some important information that can help your audience. And But before I do that, I, I also want to say this. It's uh, been six years since uh, we first met. Yes. You started out with a, a dream of what you wanted to do. And it's so exciting as I sit here now and realize how much of that dream you made come true. And it's a very important for people to understand that, that you didn't do this by accident. You did this with your intention in your heart and your mind. And that's how we create the world. And you've done a, a wonderful job of creating uh the world that you're in right now and i just wanted to acknowledge uh how you know important it is for people to know that we create this world and that where you are now i saw this six years ago as an idea and now you're here and so congratulations uh uh and and thank you very much why are we using only five percent from our conscious mind and the rest is unconscious why can't we change this and use more from our conscious the programming of the subconscious the autopilot is where all of our problems come from because when you're all of a sudden when you fall in love and you don't use the subconscious programming what did you make heaven on earth health happiness and then what happens when life gets busy and the program kicks back in again that that thing falls apart so the conclusion is simple It's the programming 
that we receive from our culture and our family in the first seven years of our lives that shapes how the rest of our life is because 95% of our life normally comes from that programming. So um, in, the, in the church, uh, this knowledge of programming is not new. It's new scientifically, but the, uh, the knowing of program is 500 years old, 500 years, because the Jesuits would say, uh, give me a child and I will show you the man. Oh, yes. I, I remember this when we presented some of your conferences and you said that after the age of six, the child is already imprinted with many irreversible habits. Well, not irreversible. You can change them, but you have to make an effort. It doesn't change by itself. And that's where the problems come from, because uh, you actually have to do some, uh, you have to do an exercise or, you know, process to change it. If you don't understand the process, then it, you, you can change it. When yeah. you understand, when you understand the process, then you can change the programming. Uh, and that's where if you understand, if we all of a sudden, all of us said, wait, Let's change the negative programming that we got when we were kids. If we all did that, the world will change tomorrow because then we'd be operating from new programs and better programs. So we can change it and we can change the world. And you have changed your own world. That's why I like talking with you because you were a person who changed the program of the, the you know, your issues with your back and your pain. You said, I, the program that gave me this, I don't want. And you made an effort, and you rewrote the program, and you rewrote your life. That's a model that I want other people to know because it shows how powerful you are as a creator when you change the programming that we got in the first seven years that made us victims or made us frail or open to sickness. That's programming. Humans are very powerful. But yes. we have been programmed to be weak. But in order to make this project happen, we have to apply for a research grant and really find the mechanism inside. Absolutely. I agree with that. And that's why it's important. I said, no, if nobody asks the question, nobody looks for the answer. But you have now asked a very good question. And so uh, it's that's worth the the money to say, that was a good question. Now let's see what, what the answer is. Uh, so you came up with a good research idea, and I think you should follow through. Let me get now to a different subject, and this is also related to behavior. Many people found out about the so-called body language and micro-expressions of the face muscles when someone is telling a lie, and, and that is the body subconsciously react to lie, and to the hidden truth, some, something you don't wish others to know about. But where does this special intelligence coming from? Here's what happens. Uh, and you're familiar, here's one of those, those uh, characteristic changes uh, is what we call muscle testing, which I know you're familiar with, where uh, you make a statement with your conscious mind, and then you hold out your arm and somebody, uh, after you make the statement, pushes on your arm. Uh, if the statement is true, the arm is strong. If the statement is not true uh, to the belief, uh, then the arm goes weak. That's muscle testing. Yeah. So it's, that's a phys And I say, well, how does that work? And here's the answer. We have two minds. A conscious mind is a creative mind with wishes and desires, and a subconscious mind has programs. And I say this. When I make a statement with my conscious mind and my subconscious mind program doesn't believe that statement because of the experience, then the conscious mind and subconscious mind are not in harmony. And the moment they're not in harmony, they change the biology. So, for example, when the, I make a statement that's not true based on my belief, the subconscious mind is out of harmony and that causes my muscles to weaken. And when I make a statement that my subconscious mind believes is true as well, so both of them believe it's true, then they're in harmony together. My thought and my biology are in harmony. And what happens, my muscles stay strong. So basically it says this. When you are making a statement that's a lie, the subconscious mind is you know, saying, wait, that's not true. The conscious mind is trying to tell somebody a lie, but the subconscious mind 
knows from the experience this is not true. That's like a muscle test, but the face changes because the muscles change when a true statement is happening versus when, a, when the muscles are, are, are expressed when a, a false statement is made, just like muscle testing, okay? It changes the, the muscles, and so there are people can all of a sudden start, as you said, there are characteristics that you can look for, even in the eyes and the iris and, and stuff like that, uh, uh, and that's how they do lie detecting. They, they put wires on, read the electrical activity. Why? It's a different signal when you tell the truth then the signal is when you tell something you believe. And so uh, why is that important? Because, as you said, if you can know how to read the signals, then you can see uh, uh, you know, a person's true understanding of what they, they believe, especially in their subconscious program. Now we are entering a new subject, and that is called the minority rule. An academic social behavior research shows that if we create the critical mass of an over 10% of the population of a group, country, or at the level of the entire world, then this behavior is rapidly transmitted towards all individuals. But to me, it's very similar to some cell behavior, either when a healing process is started or, on the contrary, a cancer cell behavior is started. Can you comment how you see this phenomenon in biology? Yeah, well, in biology, remember, let's remember, cells are like miniature people. So we can talk about people, but cells will have a very similar kind of behavior. And you say, well, how does 10% of the people change or influence the rest of the population? Well, think about this. If everybody is thinking different thoughts, there's no, there's no one thought that stands out. And as more people think the same thought, and you have to understand that uh, I think you probably have it on an earlier tape, thoughts are broadcast from our head like a, like a tuning fork in our head that vibrates. You can read this. Now, when we put wires on a person's head and read the brain activity, it's called electroencephalograph. But there's a new process to read the brain, and you put the probe near the head. You don't touch the head. You put it right near the head, and it's called magnetoencephalograph. It reads the magnetic field of the brain. And what they found is you can read the thoughts of an individual not by touching their head at all. You can put the probe out here and you can still read it. So what does that mean? It well, means well, that... Yes, yes, but it is not reading thoughts ad literam, just like in telepathy, but the energy which is produced in the brain and not the messages. It's translated into vibration. Yes, yes. yes the energy I, is I'm sending you a sound signal. I'm talking at this end, but it, the, the sound is picked up by a microphone and converted into a vibration. And at your end, uh, the vibration is turned back into sound. Well, thoughts uh, are in my head are start like an image, but it's broadcast as a vibration out into the field. So when I have a thought, and you have a thought, and we're both having the same thought, then that vibration is now twice as strong than just me having the thought alone. If I have the same thought and you have the same thought, that's two people broadcasting the same one. As more people broadcast the same one, the signal gets stronger. Every time another person has the same thought, it's broadcasting the same signal. And therefore, that signal gets stronger and stronger with more people having the same thought. Well, then we find out, well, how, much, how many people have to have uh, uh, that thought to make a powerful enough broadcast to affect the rest? And the answer, it doesn't take that many because since everybody's having different thoughts, there's no real strong one. But if 10% of the people start getting a, the same thought, the collective power of that vibration in the field is amplified enough that people that are not listening to you know that thought will start to hear it because the energy is louder and so 10% of the population seems to be a number that can influence the rest of the population so uh, th this is because uh, uh, communication is energy the more people pushing the same exact communication button is like an amplifier that amplifies the energy so when you get 10% having the same thought, they amplify the, the power of that thought. The people that don't have that thought will start to hear it. And then as they join in, 
more power. Everyone who joins in, the power gets greater. So 10% of people sharing a thought appears to be uh, like the, the level that can kick off a chain reaction and start other people to, to share the thought. And that's how a small group of people ultimately can change the uh, thinking of a large group of people. Yes, they checked uh, out that at the Rinseller Institute for the easily implemented attitudes and behavior, such as political elections, selling some products, things that are easily assimilated by the conscious mind, but for the complex behavior, like myself, for example, in doing biotransformations that we wish to spread, it, well, it could take hundreds of years or more Because even if the conscious mind accepts the idea, could be agree with it exactly as you said in our previous interview, this, however, doesn't mean that our body and our inner will actually apply and the subconscious mind do not have any ancestral learning about. So there are no previous learned knowledge about. And while easily applicable So it's a lot of the work to do. It is if you try and do it with a conscious mind, because that that means going back to remember being uh, mindful, meaning you can't let your conscious mind wander and you can control it. But humans are always thinking, so it's very hard to keep the conscious mind in total control the whole time. Uh, the, the one time we did it, as I said, when we fell in love, but we were then uh, creating a world based on uh, our conscious wishes and our desires. That's what we need to do. The hard part is this. You can educate the conscious mind, but that does not change the program in the subconscious mind because the conscious mind and subconscious mind learn in different ways. So you can teach the conscious mind very easily, but the subconscious mind only learns in a couple of different ways. Hypnosis is one way. Uh, making habits where you actually have to practice a habit every day, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, every day like a practice, and then it can become a habit. Those are the two primary ways, and they, some, they take a little bit of time, both of them. Uh, the, but there's a new field of belief change called uh, uh, energy psychology, some people call it, uh, belief change uh, uh, practices, uh, and they, they're very fast. So the old belief was change is very difficult to do. But the new understanding is if you know how to activate the subconscious, then change is easy to do. And so we're, this new knowledge is being spread. Uh, on my website, brucelipton.com, I have a whole list of resources of this new knowledge. Well, why is this important? The answer is yes, the conscious mind can have wonderful ideas, but if it doesn't, uh, if you don't reprogram the subconscious mind, The subconscious mind will keep the old ideas. It doesn't change just because you've got a new idea in your head. So uh, we have to change the subconscious because it's running 95% of the time. So if you put it, the new program in the subconscious, then it will, it, will be, it will manifest itself. And so it's not just conscious learning, but we have to uh, take that conscious learning and rewrite the programming in the subconscious mind so that we engage a different behavior than the one we were programmed with before. What is spontaneous remission, for example, in case of an illness which suddenly disappears? Yeah, now we have to recognize this. Uh, in, in my early experiments, we talked about in an earlier video, uh, I took genetically identical cells and put them into three different Petri dishes and I changed the environment, the culture medium. Uh, cells are like fish, they have to live in the fluid. <laughs> so I put all the things they need into the fluid, I call it culture medium, and I feed them. But I made a little different combination of chemicals. Uh, so I had three dishes with genetically identical cells, but different uh, combinations of chemicals in the culture medium. And in one dish, they form, the cells form muscle, another dish, the cells form bone, and a third dish, the cells form fat cells. And I say, what controls the expression of the cells, the fate of the cells? It's not the genes, because all of them have the same genes. The only thing that was different was the culture medium, the environment. And all of a sudden it says, ah, the culture medium, the information in the culture medium is controlling the fate of the cells. Yes. Now here's where the connection to the human is. The culture, a human 
is like a skin covered petri dish because under my skin I have 50 trillion cells and I have culture medium it's called blood and so when I change the chemistry of the blood I change the uh, influence on the cells because the blood is culture medium remember in the in the plastic dish when I change the, the make the chemical combination of the culture medium different I get different fates of the cells the cells become different things so in your body the blood is the culture medium and the chemistry of the culture medium controls the fate of the cells and so now we say yeah but who controls the chemistry of the culture medium I said, well the culture medium is controlled by signals from the brain hormones and uh, growth factors they call them regulators come chemicals from the brain neurochemicals I say yeah but who controls which neurochemicals come out of the brain I go that's where the mind comes in when when you uh, are in love the chemistry that goes from your brain into the blood includes things like dopamine uh, for pleasure vasopressin for uh, attractiveness uh, um, growth hormone which gives health to the body these are the chemicals that come out of the brain when you're thinking in love and this goes into the blood and these chemicals in the blood are the culture medium and that's why when you fall in love those chemicals cause the cells to become healthy the, if I add those chemicals that come out of the brain of a person in love to a plastic petri dish with cells the cells grow beautifully then I say okay wait the same person instead of being in love is afraid or I say well, the brain, when a person is afraid, the brain doesn't release the love chemicals. It releases different chemicals to organize the body to take care of the fear. And I say, well, things like histamine and stress hormones, they come out of the brain of a person in fear. So I say, oh, you change the culture medium. When you're in love, you have one set of chemicals. When you're in fear, you have a different set of chemicals. But the fear chemicals don't give health to the cells. They actually cause the cells to, to, to shut down their growth and that's when sickness starts. So why is this important? The answer is that the cells in the body are the fate is controlled by the chemical composition of the blood and the chemical composition of the blood is controlled by the thoughts in the mind. If I have a belief that I have a disease and that the, the disease is going to kill me, the chemistry of that thought will make the disease and the chemistry of that thought will kill me because but, I'm changing the culture medium to fit the thought but so yes yes I agree but there are many people who will also die even if they don't know that this kind of disease will kill them no because the idea is it the disease they don't have to know about the disease they're living a life out of harmony out of balance that the chemi that the culture medium their blood and a, a person who is not living in harmony and balance the chemistry from the brain that goes in the blood is not going to support harmony and balance so they don't have to think about it at all they're just not living in harmony and balance so what happens in a spontaneous remission is this a person was living one way with whatever thoughts they have about stress and fear and and not good enough whatever you know whatever chemistry coming from a brain under stress causes an illness and then I then you tell the person you say listen uh, you, you're gonna die in three months so go home and take care of, of your life because you're gonna die in three months some people go home and they wait the three months and then they die <laughs> in the three months because that's what the brain said three months we shut off okay and I say but another patient uh, hears that oh, I only have three months to live and they say oh if I only have three months to live, I'm going to go out and I'm going to enjoy my life for the last three months. I'm going to let go of all my problems. I'm going to let go of all my stress and enjoy my life. Well, when they start to go out and enjoy their life, the chemistry from the brain changes and they now have the chemistry of enjoyment and life and looking forward to stuff. Well, guess what? They change the culture medium chemistry, the blood, and the chemistry of that joy and love is chemistry that supports health so when they were thinking the old way they were creating disease and then how they get a spontaneous remission they let go of the negative thoughts and the negative programming they said I'm just gonna enjoy myself well enjoying yourself releases chemistry joy chemistry that that causes the cells to be happy and they grow better so you can be sick change your mind boom you're not sick anymore spontaneous remission
That's how it works. Yes. And also in your book, there is a chapter called Fractal Evolution. What is fractal evolution? First, we have to understand that uh, the physical world, uh, anything physical, and you put it into space, there's a mathematics, there's math that how you can do this. It's called geometry. So like all the buildings and the machines that humans make are based on a, a geometry uh, uh, it's called in a Latin name uh, Euclidean geometry, uh, and this is the uh, the geometry uh, that we like with squares and cubes and cones, spheres. The geometry that we that we learned in school. But when you look at nature, there's a different geometry. It's, it doesn't have the same principle. The geometry of nature is called fractal geometry. So it's not the geometry we learned in school. It's a new geometry. And, and the interesting thing about fractal geometry is that the mathematics is you use the same equation, and when you solve the equation, you take the answer, put it back into the equation, solve it again, get a new answer, put it back into the same equation, solve it again. So you use the same equation and repeat it and repeat it. Well, there's a significance about that. Because when you repeat the same equation, you repeat the patterns. And so nature is made out of fractal geometry. Fractal geometry says that patterns are repeated at different levels, from the microscopic level to the macroscopic level. There are going to be basic patterns, and they're repeated all over again. The, uh, the Russian dolls, I forget, Stroyoshka? I can't remember the name. The Russian dolls, the wooden, we uh, open yes. up and watch. Yes, I know, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, why, why is that important? Because every doll is like the other dolls, not exactly the same, but it's almost the same, and one fits inside the other, so there's a smaller one, then a larger one, and a larger one. They all have the same shape, but they, they might look a little different, and, and that's an example of fractal geometry. The pattern of the doll is repeated no matter what size doll you're looking at. Okay, bottom line, nature is based on repeated patterns. And that the patterns at any level, a higher level, can be compared to the patterns at a lower level because it's built into the mathematics. The math is, the, this is a, an old statement from ancient wisdom, but this math is that statement. Uh, the, old, the old statement is, as above, so below. It turns out, this is the, the, the fundamental basis of, of fractals, a structure above is similar to the structure below, as above, so below, meaning if you study the above one, you'll understand the lower one. If you study the lower one, the smaller one, you'll get an understanding of the upper one. And so nature is built on a geometry as above, so below. So the patterns that we're expressing in nature are not new patterns, they're repeated at different levels. So if you understand how a cell works, a small, you know, the small unit, a human is like a giant cell. So basically, the principles of the cell are the same principles of the human. That's why when we study research in the university and we study cells, the answers that we get from studying cells apply to the whole human. So this becomes very helpful because in a world based on fractal evolution, you can predict a future if you understood the pattern from the past, because it'll be reproduced in a similar way. So fractal geometry is exciting because it gives us an understanding of how the universe works without having to understand the whole universe. You only have to understand parts of it because the pattern will repeat itself. So you, you can study at any level, the microscopic level, study the cell, and you'll understand the human. Or yeah. if you understand the human, you could understand the cell. Nassim Haramein has a very interesting theory of the fractal structures of space, but I am not allowed to show this on TV. We should have knowledge, and, and we should, if we have knowledge, we should share knowledge, because that's how all of us evolve, uh, is by sharing knowledge, and that's why people coming together in a community are more powerful than people living separate from each other, because in community, you share awareness, and the more awareness you share, the smarter the whole community becomes. Now comes a positive example. Howard Bloom has a book called The Global Brain, and 
His idea describes that the network of life on Earth as one that is in fact a complex adaptive system, a global brain in which each of us plays a sometimes conscious, sometimes unknowing role, and he reveals that, for example, the World Wide Web is just a step in the development of this brain. Absolutely. As I said, uh, cells are miniature people. And when life first started, the cells were individuals like amoebas. They, they went around on their own. But they started to recognize they could be smarter if the amoebas came together and lived in a community together because they could share their awareness. So you think about a human, and I say, look how intelligent a human is. And I say, yeah, but a human is made out of 50 trillion cells. So the intelligence of a human is the combined intelligence the combined intelligence of 50 trillion cells that come together in a community. And so uh, our evolution uh, is going to uh, be fractal, which means it's going to repeat the pattern. And in that fractal, we can compare humans to what happened at the level of cells, for example. And, and what we're beginning to see is that uh, a human is a cell in a bigger community of cells, like in, a, in your body, a, a skin cell is like an amoeba in a community with 50 trillion other cells sharing the work and doing different jobs. And a human population uh, is that we are cells and each one of us coming together with all the other cells makes a super organism to share awareness. So look, an amoeba doesn't know how to make a rocket ship and go to the moon, <clears throat> but 50 trillion amoebas coming together to make a human can collectively share that intelligence that we can think of a rocket going to the moon. Well, an amoeba can't think of that. 50 trillion of them can. I say a human is like a cell. Each of us has a certain amount of intelligence. When you put 7 billion cells together into one community, the awareness of that intelligence collectively come together is far greater than we could ever imagine. That's why our evolution is to bring us together and connect us into one organism. And that's why the internet has become so important because it is the nervous system that connects seven billion human cells into one consciousness just as much as 50 trillion cells are connected to the brain to share the consciousness of the brain. Seven billion humans are coming together to create an organism called humanity. Humanity is the organism, and we are the cells in the body of humanity, but we have to be connected. So the internet is a nervous system that allows 7 billion cells to share their awareness, and that amount of awareness that will come from 7 billion people in one harmonious body will yes. take us beyond anything we could even think of right now. And I remember that famous experiment on Princeton University named the Global Consciousness Projects, which literally demonstrated the power of the collective global mind over matter. Well, th you remember we talked about magnetoencephalograph reading the brain activity of an individual. And what the Global Coherence Project revealed is when a large number of individuals having the same experience at the same time each one a small broadcast, but when you multiply it by how many have the same small broadcast, it's like power. It's like how many watts. So you say one, one person has one watt of activity, and I say, yeah, but seven billion people have seven billion watts of activity, and all of a sudden you realize the more people come in together into this harmony, the more power is being broadcast. Now when they looked at the electromagnetic field of the earth, they found that when a large enough number of humans share the same thought, broadcast, the same electromagnetic field, they make a, a, a powerful broadcast. Yes, yes, yes. So all of a sudden it says the power of the human is not in the individual human. The power of the human is when seven billion humans work together because we can change the world physically in which we are living. What is the difference between memes and genes? Memes and genes are both active germline leg preprecators or optimons that compete with alternative forms. Yeah. Uh, there, remember, we used to think genes controlled life. 
So we look at genes as blueprints. Well, yes, they are blueprints, but they only control the physical body. But we can program the life, and this is like when a, a child is growing up. We've talked about the first seven years of programming. Well, that's like you have a computer which is con made by genes, but the programming of the computer is made by ideas. They're not physical. They're transmitted from one person to another. These are memes. And the, so I, I, I use the genes to make this computer called the body, and I use the memes as programming of the computer, the genes are physical. The memes are, are electromagnetic energy that are passed from one generation to the next generation, but they're both controlling the outcome of the body. Our thoughts control our body, and that's through epigenetics. Genetics habits. makes... Habits genetics. can be memes, habits. Excuse me, habits? Habits can be also memes. Oh, they are the expression of memes. Habits, habits uh, become so programmed that we just broadcast them whether we're thinking about them or not. And they're picked up by others as well. So memes are communication uh, that we create and pass from one to another. So when you're making a habit, you're creating a meme for that habit. And other people can pick up that, that habit. It's like the hundredth monkey story uh, where you teach one monkey how to do something uh, and then later it will be passed on to the other monkeys. So uh, the idea is a meme is not the physical biology, but it's the use of the biology. It's the use of the, the body, what you do with your body, your behavior, your actions. These are controlled by the programming, but the programming is not physical. It's energy. So genes are physical programming. Memes are energetic programming. And they're different. Genes make the computer but memes tell the computer what to do. Uh, please tell us about the imaginal cells, imaginal neurons. This is a new concept developed in neurology and psychology. Yeah, well, it, it's a, a imaginal cells. Uh, basically, uh, what we have are stem cells. And imaginal cells are like stem cells, and we really relate to them in like the growth of a, from a caterpillar to a butterfly. Uh, remember, cells are miniature people. So think about this. When a caterpillar is changing into a gutter butterfly, what's happening? Well, imagine you're a cell, a miniature person in a, in a caterpillar, uh, and let's say your job is uh, you're working in the digestive system, and when the caterpillar is growing, everybody, all the billions of cells are working and creating the life of the caterpillar inside under the skin. But then when a caterpillar is ready to go into a butterfly, all of the functions stop. The caterpillar doesn't eat. It doesn't move. It's just wrapped itself up in the skin. Well, what happens is it's just like where the world is going right now. Uh, people are losing their jobs. There's not enough work. Uh, people, the structure is falling apart. People are afraid, and they're going, oh, my goodness, the whole thing's falling apart. Well, if you're a cell in a caterpillar that's going to turn into a butterfly, before it turns into a butterfly, it falls apart. And so all these cells are, like, out of work, and they're all going, what are we going to do? And what are imaginal cells? They're leaders. Imaginal cells come in with a new idea and say, we have a new idea to build something bigger and better. And so the imaginal cells are like teachers and leaders that organize the other cells to go from the old structure and to assemble in a different way and create the new structure called the butterfly. Well, in human civilization, it's like the caterpillar. We're coming to a change. And we're moving out of an old structure, like the world today is in caterpillar, and we're moving into a world that will be more like a butterfly. Well, how does that happen? Well, the first thing is this. The structure of the old world falls apart. And through imaginal cells, which are teachers and educators and ideas, new ideas, um, this shapes the population to move from the old world we're in now and create a much better, more powerful world in the future. So just as a caterpillar uh, undergoes metamorphosis to form a butterfly, human civilization at this moment is undergoing a change to go from an old way of life into a higher form of life. But you have to, just like the caterpillar, the structure breaks down. And then imaginal cells shape the future uh, where we move out of the old beliefs into a new belief. And so 
Um, imaginal cells in, in organisms or, or leaders, such as imaginal cell in the butterfly, leads the population, says here's a better structure, and they make a better structure. In human civilization, uh, people that are teaching the new sciences and expressing the new sciences of life are also equivalent to imaginal cells because their knowledge and their discovery will shape the world into a much higher level of organization and uh, a, a better, uh, a more intelligent population than the one we have right now. Last question for our viewers from your book, The Honeymoon Effect. What to pay attention to in our intimate relations? Yeah, uh, so basically what the honeymoon uh, uh, effect is about, we mentioned it briefly earlier, is when people fall in love, their lives change. They get healthier, they have more energy, uh, they create a much better world. And the honeymoon effect, the understanding is, how did we do that? And, and now science has revealed that, mo most importantly, when we're falling in love, we, don't, we keep our conscious mind present almost 100% of the time. So that means we're creating from wishes and desires. When we fall out of that love, it's because the conscious mind starts thinking a lot, and then we start playing the old programs that we got from other people, which are not very good. So it says get out of the program. When we're not using the program, uh, we create a much better life. It, there, there's a movie most people have seen called The Matrix. And in The Matrix, they say take the blue pill and go back into the programming or take the red pill and get out of the programming. Uh, and it's really a, like a true story because when we're in the programming, we become limited by the means that you talked about. The beliefs of others control our computers and those beliefs of others have disempowered us. So the honeymoon effect reveals, well, how did you get so powerful to create heaven when you fell in love? And the answer is, we didn't use the program. And this is why if people stop using the programming we got, the planet would, <laughs> people would start creating what they love. The planet wouldn't be in war. The planet would be in love. And, and the important understanding is this, that we're looking for cooperation. This is what evolution is all about. Although Darwinian theory said that evolution is based on competition. It was based on a, a, a philosophy from a man called Thomas Malthus. And he was the guy that came up with the idea that said, animals reproduce faster than plants. And this will create a problem because if animals eat plants and there are too many animals and not enough plants, then the animals are going to have to fight each other for the food. And this is called competition. And the strongest one will get the food and the weakest one will die. That's the Darwinian theory. That's where it came from. Well, the problem is this. Malthus' idea is not biologically correct. Animals don't uh, outproduce the plants. They're in balance with each other. So it turns out it's not a need for competition. It turns out what we need is a need for cooperation. And the newest theories of evolution are talking more about the fact that evolution is the result of cooperation, not Darwinian competition. That a garden, when we talk about like the Garden of Eden or something, remember, a garden is a place of harmony. It's not a battle zone. All the plants and all the organisms in a garden are working in harmony with each, with each other, and that's when you get the beautiful garden. When they start competing with each other and fighting each other, the garden becomes destroyed. And this is the, the, the earth as we see it right now because we bought the belief that evolution is based on competition and we, we believe that there's not enough for us. And so we go out there and fight the other person in order to get what we need to stay alive. And we call it, oh, that's Darwinian evolution, survival of the fittest. The strongest one wins. And it turns out this has nothing to do really in the major drive of evolution. The major drive of evolution is organisms coming together and forming cooperative communities that support each other. That's evolution. So we have to change the programming that we bought a long time ago that life is a struggle and we have to fight each other to recognize, no, life is harmony and beauty and we can all live in peace with each other and there's enough for all of us. This will prevent us from ruining the planet and killing ourselves. So we're in a very important stage of evolution that says the belief 
that we got from Darwin, which makes a culture. The beliefs of science shape the culture. Matter of fact, in Nazi Germany, uh, the, the, the Nazis took Darwin's word for absolute science. And they said, well, for us to survive, we have to be the strongest and fittest and kill off all the weak ones. <laughs> so they, they made a government based strictly on Darwinian theory. I say, what is the consequence of that? And I say, well, you saw it. It, it was a destructive power that almost destroyed the planet with its, with its crazy thinking. So Darwin's idea is not the drive of evolution. The drive of evolution is cooperation and community because that's where harmony comes from. And harmony creates balance. And that's what we're looking at right now is to change the belief of the world and get out of the old science because the old science is a science that has created the problems of today. It is amazing because what you had just said, I heard Richard Dawkins talking about in one of his conferences and here are his words. But to live our lives in a Darwinian way, to make a society as a Darwinian society, that would be a very unpleasant society in which to live. And these are the excerpts from debate Richard Dawkins versus Cardinal George Pell, 2012. It's funny because he's the strongest supporter of Darwin. So when uh, you showed me that quote, I was surprised myself because he's such a strong supporter of Darwin that this, you know, is a statement that doesn't support Darwin very much. But I have found out what is the missing link. And the missing link, I was told by Howard Bloom, who said, Well, yes, we live in a Darwinian society, and it has produced a lot of good results for us. But Richard Dawkins, who is the Pope, has made himself the Pope of Darwinism does not understand evolution. Yeah, Richard Dawkins. Exactly. <laughs> Richard Dawkins and I profoundly disagree about certain things. He is a brilliant man, Christian. He is astonishing. His books are excruciatingly worth reading. I mean, they're exhilarating to read. He's a fabulous writer, and his ideas are wonderful. But at the base of his ideas is an assumption that is dead wrong. And it's the assumption of the selfish gene. Absolutely correct. Totally correct. Totally right. And 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 Dawkins. Yes. He he just reader of Dar of Darwin and stuff like that. So his basis in science is not really very strong. So he has more opinions than he has science, and his opinions are are, are totally wrong. I remember in the book the uh, the blind watchmaker. I think that book about the selfish gene. He actually said that um, that if Darwinian, if Lamarck was right, and Lamarck's theory of evolution was cooperation between the organisms and the planet, and how it was how it was created, uh, Dawkins said if Lamarck's theory is right, then my whole idea is totally wrong. And guess what? Since that time he wrote that book, we are now in the area where Lamarck's theory is coming back to become the main theory of evolution, which by definition, he even said, will cancel my ideas. And it's like, yeah, you're right. His ideas are totally wrong. And they're, they're destructive, just like Darwinian theory is, uh, because he's a proponent of that. He's a proponent of competition and fighting and, you know, letting the weak people die. But maybe he is changing his ideas. What do you say about that? Because I was surprised to hear that phrase in a debate with Richard Dawkins versus uh, Cardinal George Pell year 2012. And it is on the YouTube and you can watch it. Well, I, I have to look that one up because you're right. If he's starting to talk like that, then he's changing his position. And <laughs> Yeah. He has to, because his position was wrong anyway, so this becomes uh, a good idea, <laughs> because his old, his old ideas are very destructive. But I also have to say that uh, Howard Bloom appreciated other ideas of Dawkins, and he said he is well informed, with this exception, which is possible in time will correct himself. Well, uh, he either corrects himself or he's going to disappear <laughs> very quickly, because people are going to reject the ideas. So he either changes his ideas, or if he sticks with his ideas, then he's going to disappear. So he has two choices, to stay or to go, and that depends on if he changes his mind. I thank you so much, dear Dr. Bruce Lipton, for having you in our program for the third time, and for having you in two consecutive episodes. 
All right. Well, I so appreciate that. And thank you so much. And I'm very proud of what you're doing. And I'm very uh, uh, excited that you have an audience because that means everybody listening is opening up to new ideas and thinking. So uh, you're helping the world evolve. And thank you very much. And we'll talk again soon. And we'll deal with the answers to the questions later. I thank you so much. All the best. Goodbye. Legislația Consiliului Național a audio ne recomandă să prezentăm puncte de vedere diverse, mai ales atunci când subiectele în discuție au legătură cu sănătatea.